Hello, everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk World Talk Show presented by ClickUp Equitators. Today, we have Mr. Amitabh Tewari with us. He's the fourth generation lawyer uh, practicing at the Punjab and Haryana High Court at uh, Chandigarh with a rich and diverse experience across uh, various sectors of law, which I'm going to enlist uh, very soon. He completed his uh, Bachelor of uh, Civil Law from uh, University of Oxford. So we'll be understanding what the difference between the UK system and the India system there. And his spectrum of practice, I mean, in terms of legal practice, is pretty large, including civil law, criminal law, corporate law, service law, sports law, or real estate law, and so on and so forth. So there are so many things that we will, of course, learn about uh, Mr. Tiwari now here. But uh, without further ado, let me first of all introduce you to the man himself. Hello, Mr. Tiwari. How are you doing? Hi, Sagar. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm, good. I'm doing great, sir. Thank you very much for asking. And thank you for joining us, giving me... Uh, just to let everyone know, there are some technical glitches that we were facing. You know, technology is good when it works, but it was really not working for us. Uh, but I really appreciate you getting more half an hour for, for us. So without further ado, I've tried to cover things about your profile. I would basically dive into your practice. I mean, if I understand about the litigation. So what kind of litigation cases you really handle or work on? So like you said, initially that I'm a fourth generation lawyer. My grandfather started his practice in the, great grandfather started his practice in the Petsu High Court, you know, during the pre-British era and right after the independence. And he did a lot of civil law, the old school civil litigation of land and co property, which was then taken over by my grandfather who also started practicing in Patiala district courts. Later on, my father started practicing in the high court where he did a lot of constitution and public law matters regarding the employee disputes. He was for the state in most of the cases. So now I, after my LLM, I worked in Amachan Mangaldas for like one year where I did a lot of um, advisory litigation where we advised on disputes and the shareholder agreements, joint, joint ventures, et cetera, et cetera. And basically arbitration related work. Mm -hmm. Because that was on the advisory side, I wanted some more litigation experience. I shifted to Wadia Gandhi and Company, which is in Delhi. Mm -hmm. There, I actually got the first flavor of litigation where we did SLPs, we did all the matters coming from the Bombay High Court, challenging the orders. Of, it, was, it, had, it had a lot of corporate and commercial work, a bit of civil work as well. Mm -hmm. After these two years, as I really wanted to get back to practice and open up my own office, I came back to Chandigarh. Mm -hmm. And as a young lawyer at the time, I can't, we can't choose, you know, we can't choose. So I started handling everything which came my way, which included civil matters, revisions, appeals, disputes into criminal matters, criminal appeals, bail applications. I was, I was also impaneled and I became a UT standing counsel in the central administrative tribunal. So I did a lot, I still do a lot of service law for the state. I also, like you said, I do a lot of RERA work because RERA was up and coming at that time, in addition to NCLT work. I was most fortunate at the time that I got an opportunity to do sports law, which is really niche. And I was representing Minerva Punjab FC in almost all the litigation for three years. So like I said, I have a very rich experience in all fields of law at the moment. And I actually believe that at this age, at this time of my career, I should be doing everything which comes my way. So yeah, that's about it. Uh, you know, the, in my experience till now, it's been four years and I hope to not carry on further. Well, that's beautiful. I mean, yes, of course. I mean, we all know about, you know, criminal law, corporate law, yeah. uh, civil law, real estate law, yeah. pretty yeah. common. Sports law and for that matter of fact, even environment law is pretty niche and someone, yeah. if you are having an interaction uh, right there, we'll be having furthermore dwelling down to that particular yeah. uh, niche space of the, mm -hmm. of the practice. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's proceed with the, you know, uh, in the discussion. Uh, you have worked, you know, in several uh, sort of organizations, as to mention, before you really, you know, came back. Um, if I can understand so far, you know, one of a complex uh, legal issue that you've worked on, and if you can sort of describe the complexity right there and tell us about how you really approached it. Yeah, so I, so when I started my career in practice, the first case, I, I like I said, I started sport, doing sports law. And the moment I left my job at Bardek Andrian Company, the next day I was engaged for a matter before the All India Football Federation. So those were some normal matters, but regarding that, the First one that comes to my mind is last year when I represented this footballer called Anwar Ali. Now, he, this was a very interesting case, a very interesting case because it did not have precedent in India. So I was representing Mr. Ali. He had a heart condition, which, you know, you, you must have read Christian Eriksen got a heart attack in the Euros mm -hmm. you know, last year. So he also, he had the same condition. So 
when, when he was giving his trials for Mumbai City FC, they realized that he has a heart condition and then they informed the All India Football Federation who then did not ban him, but they just said that you can't play right now. Mm -hmm. So essentially, this the petitioner in the case, Mr. Ali, who was fit and fine, who was playing, who had no symptoms as such, was stopped from playing football because of the reason that he might have a heart attack in the future, which obviously no one knows about. Is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? So he approached me and we suggested we moved a writ petition in the Delhi High. And the basic question there was, obviously, apart from the fact that he's 19 years old and his right to livelihood is at stake, so how much can a federation decide about the health of an individual and on that basis take away his life mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on a future can uh, on a future thing which might or might not happen mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so we we i delved into my own knowledge at oxford in that time because i'd taken medical law and ethics over there plus i was an avid sports fan and a football fan and we delved into the other jurisdiction where people are allowed to play mm -hmm. And we, you know, made the red petition on the line, lines of right to livelihood and the fact that we don't know if this will happen. How can you take away the life, his right to live and earn during this stage? So the Delhi High Court initially was not in favor, but eventually they said, okay, you can play, but they remanded the matter to the sports committee of the All India Football Federation, where we again argued the matter at length. And eventually they came around and they said, yeah, you can play. But mm -hmm. they said that, you know, we will not, you will not make us liable, which mm -hmm. I also understand because at the end of the day, even the Federation did not want mm -hmm. any untoward incident to happen on the field. So this was a very interesting case at the time. Another one, which I did was regarding when the Pulwama attack happened and everyone will relate to all these cases, these cases, because I'm a young lawyer, right? We do such cases all the time. So the attack had happened and after four days, Minerva had to play real Kashmir FC in Srinagar. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. we represented to the AIFF telling them what, that we can't, we can't play right now. Mm -hmm. We have foreign players and the embassies have said that that's not a safe place to go right now. So we wanted to postpone the match. But the AIFF docked three points because we did not go. Mm -hmm. so we then again approached the Delhi High Court. We said that, you know, we need to postpone this match because, you know, right now the situation in Srinagar is very critical. The, AI, the Delhi High Court again remanded the matter to the AIFF I League Committee. And the I League Committee and the Emergency Committee then eventually uh, came around again and said that at the time the, the situation was that bad and the player's safety is paramount. So this was another important case, which I did. Another one, which I did was when I represented Minerva in the contractual dispute with a Macedonian player in Zurich in the FIFA dispute resolution chamber, even though uh, we lost, but again, that was a very exciting experience for me. Mm -hmm. Apart mm -hmm. from sports law, I do a lot of civil and criminal litigation. And one of the most important cases I did on the criminal side was when I had filed an anticipatory bail application for a juvenile. Now, there are divergent views of various high courts where they've said that anticipatory bail of a juvenile is not maintained. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even my parent high court where I practice, they have separate, a lot of, lot of judges have said it is maintainable. Some have said it's not maintainable. Mm -hmm. But I was able to convince them that it is maintainable and I got the relief. Mm -hmm. And later on, another coordinate bench referred the matter to a larger bench to finally decide this issue. Mm -hmm. So this was also a very, very... Um, interesting case at the time when we had argued mm -hmm. at length on the maintainability of our anticipatory bail application on behalf of a juvenile. So these are the some of some these are some of the important cases I've done in my short career. So and, that's that's beautiful. That's beautiful because you know when we talk about the cases, we 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 also understand that um, being part of sports law. You know uh, when when we when you say sports law, the the next question that comes to me: Do you deal with the cricket cases? Uh, but no, that, that, that's also then then you're again in the niche sport right there. I've actually point. done that. I filed it petitions against the Punjab Cricket Association also in a high court. Okay. But that is, even though it's a cricket association, those are um, mainly service disputes regarding, uh, I won't say service disputes, it's just the members have been thrown out of the committees without hearing. Essentially, the rules and regulations of the PC have not been followed. So it's kind of an amalgamation of service law and public law in mm -hmm. that sense. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and constitutional law, obviously, which is mm -hmm. the Magna Carta of the entire, of all litigation in India. 
So yeah, so that's the that's the ambit of my litigation as of now. No, no that's good. I mean, being a lawyer, uh, being a lawyer practicing a niche practice, being a football fan, and then working for the same. I mean, yeah, sort yeah, of dream yeah. come true. I, mean, I, 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 I'd like to just clarify. I don't do only sports law. That was mm-hmm. something. I understand. Yeah. Time, right, but like I said, in our high court in Punjab and Haryana, it's a it's an agrarian state, right? So you mm-hmm. do a lot of land disputes, and obviously there are a lot of criminal matters as well. Mm-hmm. There's tax matters as well. So these were the matters that the matter which I had discussed were the ones in the media at the time, mm-hmm. right? So, so so I can say they were noteworthy in that sense. For me, all the cases are noteworthy. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Okay, talking about something that is again coming, you know, trying to hit us. I mean, the third wave of COVID. Uh, we have seen in this pandemic, you know, court hearings being, uh, you know, it it began to move towards some more remote proceedings and uh, availability, so as to call. What do you think? I asked this question to uh, someone in the previous session as well. Yeah. Is this really sustainable? And uh, is it a is it even a possible way to increase access to justice uh, in the future? And this is a pretty tricky question because on the one hand you are giving you are giving access to a lot of people who otherwise would not have it, but in our country, which is a developing country, it's not sustainable as of now because even though the big high courts will have the infrastructure. Mm-hmm. The lower courts and the tehsils and the districts, they on a practical level, I've seen myself, mm-hmm. leaving Delhi aside, they do not have the requisite infrastructure to deal with it. They don't have it. So unless until you and even though and even some of the districts do have it, but the lawyers are not educated enough. Mm-hmm. They are not aware enough because they are so set in tune with the entire physical aspect that they do not want to maybe change or they are not incentivized enough to change. So unless until we have that kind of infrastructure across not only the Supreme Court and the high courts, but especially the lower courts from where the actual work begins, mm-hmm. then I don't think this is sustainable. And even though on paper it seems like we can give access to anyone, but mm-hmm. practically we also know that leaving the big cities aside, the internet bandwidth is not there, the mm-hmm. infrastructure development is not there. So it is sustainable in a sense. I think it's sustainable on paper as of today. And that's that's reality, the same answer that I received actually yeah, from, from reality, many lawyers. In reality, it might help a few lawyers. It might help some practitioners, but the bulk of the profession still suffers because mm-hmm. even during this pandemic, the actual people are the young lawyers who are working over there. A lot of them left practice. That mm-hmm. is the reality, and they mm-hmm. left practice because. They could not deliver justice. They could not, you know, get clients, or even a lot of clients did not know what was happening because mm-hmm. they also so used to going physically. And so, yeah, so it is to make it sustainable. It is a very good idea on paper. There has to be first. There has to be an infrastructure push to make it happen. Otherwise, otherwise there will be problems. Even the even in places where there is infrastructure, the internet bandwidth is so slow that you're not able. To, you're not able to hear the other lawyers or there is you know there is a pause and then that, that takes away the concept of justice and the matters get adjourned sine die then so then it just, it just the purpose is not solved yeah that's right i mean that's the same answer that we received so we we now believe that it's a fact uh, yeah. because everybody has uh, with having same opinion which is why which is why there was a the, everyone wanted physical hearings to restart because only then will everything again start. Because if it was so easy, the people would have used it. Mm-hmm. Or, or, the, or you know, there has to be infrastructure push, and in addition, there has to be an awareness. Mm-hmm. There has to be more workshops, or th- something has to happen. There has to be a policy around this. We just can't have a wave and then go back to VC, and then suddenly when the wave stops, go back to physical. Because everyone then wants to come back to physical. Then eventually, they will not think about the VC. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's right. Um, okay, because it also seems like you know. Uh, I, yes, I mean, yesterday I had a session with someone, and he meant he mentioned a lot of facts right there in terms of pending cases uh, in the courts as well. So that's why this question, you know, every time comes. So pending down. Case, also one can, in my experience, you can do small cases like you can argue a bail, you can mm-hmm. argue a small anticipatory bail or a small restitution, but the appeals which require appreciation of evidence to argue them on VC. It, it's very difficult to argue that. Argue VC. I also some lawyers do it, no doubt. And Supreme Court people were still arguing. The lawyers were arguing, but 
I would rather argue those matters physically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Small matters, yes, one can actually go ahead and do it on VC, but mm-hmm. the big matters where you know appeals are pending, one has to argue physically in order mm-hmm. to be able to make an impact or be able to assist the court mm-hmm. to reach to a proper conclusion. It makes sense. Great, yeah. cool. All right. Moving further in this, I mean, we are when we are talking about some changes and some new things being implemented, uh, we also know that we are now uh, sort of entering the data of, uh, I mean, I mean, you know, the era of uh, technology. Yeah. Uh, and in this era of legal technology, the the law tech, the legal tech, what are the uh, most commonly used tools? Uh, let's say for you. So I know I'll just uh, I'll answer that question, but I also want to add the add on to the previous question mm-hmm. it will you know it will complement those two so for me for example now we've had obviously the zoom there's uh, mm-hmm. all the there's video connect there is cisco webex all the conferences are happening online so we are using all these technologies mm-hmm. we have had, the bandwidth has increased uh, in terms of making it easier to appear now another thing is when we do when we add all this to our infrastructure Obviously, it the, the the end cost has to go to the client. So mm-hmm. again, the access to justice part mm-hmm. again becomes a problem. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So that's another thing I wanted to add. Mm-hmm. The other thing we add, I use uh, the uh, a lot of my libraries online. Yes, I do have a physical library, but Eastern Book Company, the SCC online, Legit Quest, all these all these online research softwares I use. Plus, I, I'm a member of the libraries at Oxford, so we use a lot of best law over there and the research material from those mm-hmm. places. Mm-hmm. Moreover, now in the age of digitization, I actually have started scanning everything. Mm-hmm. All mm-hmm. my files are finally scanned and kept on mm-hmm. Google Drive or OneDrive so mm-hmm. that my entire office can access it remotely also, even if they're on mm-hmm. vacation or wherever they are, if something needs to be done. That also helps in the space constraints at the office where you have bulky files, you just scan it and put it somewhere. Mm-hmm. I also started arguing with my iPads, you know, you can bookmark it on the iPad and it's pretty convenient to do that. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit of a change, but once you start doing it, it's pretty convenient to do it. Mm-hmm. You don't need to be carrying all your bulky files everywhere. Mm-hmm. So these are the, some of the tools which we use now in order to make it easier for the clients also and to make it easier for ourselves also. And to just streamline everything, and it also helps save paper. So there's an environmental impact there as well. So mm-hmm. yeah, these are some of the tools which we use, and hopefully, cool, beautiful. I guess these these can be helpful for other lawyers as well who are you know Definitely. basically practicing yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool, so cool, cool. All right. Will make you change if you don't change, and you'll be left behind. Really. That's right. I mean, change is the only constant thing. That's yeah, yeah. that's what they say. Um, Talking about you, know, you also mentioned about. I mean, you're you're part of the Oxford societies, and you know, you you have so many things to follow forward with. Uh, you have done your bachelor's of of, of civil law from University of Oxford. Yes. Uh, I also want to. I want my, our viewers also to understand, and for me as well, the difference between the Indian system, let's say, of education or of the way the approaches, or or the basic difference between India and UK in terms of legal approaches. So I did my graduation from Government Law College, Bombay. Mm-hmm. Now, Government Law College is a little different from all the other law schools in the country. Mm-hmm. The academic rigor over there is not as, you know, it's, the level is not as high. But what the college gives you is, I won't say as high, I'll say it's not as rigorous, you know. Mm-hmm. They, so what the college gives you is a chance to start working from the first year itself. So over there, it's like everyone everyone can decide what they want to do. If you want to do moot courts, you can do moot courts. You want to start publishing papers, you can do that. You want to study very hard, you can study very hard. But a lot of us in the college, we started working from our first year itself. Mm-hmm. We started going because the college is so close to the high court and to the law firm, best law firm of the country. The entire college used to start working in the first year itself. Mm-hmm. By the time we came to the fifth year, our entire legal knowledge was based on practical knowledge with mm-hmm. academic academic rigor as well. So there, that was the advantage which we had. So by the time we came out of law school, we had already done internships in all sorts of laws, worked in law firms for like years on end, for two, two years at a stretch. 
and mm-hmm. you understand the practical aspects, which is the most important thing. Mm-hmm. Eventually, when you come into practice or you get into a job, that is what is most important. Mm-hmm. So my entire learning of law was on the practical side, more on the practical side, less on the academic mm-hmm. side. So I always thought that there is a bit, there's something missing, which is why I did the LLM. Mm-hmm. Obviously, now the LLM abroad is much more rigorous. It's mm-hmm. much more interactive. They have a tutorial system over there where four of us, you know, sit with the tutor and we discuss the the seminars mm-hmm. and they ask questions. They force you to think more analytically. Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. all did this in GLC also, but on the practical side. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In the other law schools of the country, there is much more academic rigor. But on those uh, with those law schools, the practical aspect is missing. So GLC gave me that advantage to work practically as well as study hard. Mm-hmm. But because I wanted more academic rigor, I tried to pursue my LL- I wanted to pursue my LLM from Oxford, which was again a very good opportunity. Mm-hmm. And over there, the, the attention to detail is also something uh, which is very different, right? They, you have to research a lot. You need to write proper papers. You need to analyze every problem in detail. You need to discuss different pros and cons of everything, which was something different from GLC. Mm-hmm. So this is the difference I felt, but I'm sure the other law school in the country also work, they try to work on this model itself. But mm-hmm. my graduation, it was most of, it was mostly practical knowledge, which we gained mm-hmm. while coming up here. Yeah. And we also worked with the top lawyers. So essentially our teachers were the senior advocates of Bombay High Court, the top law firm partners who we eventually work for. Mm-hmm. Right? So that way, we really understood what needs to be done in order to be successful in the field. Oh, that's beautiful. That's that's beautiful. Uh, last question, you know, before we really leave you, because we already have acquired like, I mean, 50 minutes of yours instead of 30 minutes. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for that. Nope. But um, the last question that I want to ask you is, what would be your suggestions? I mean, we understand that you are a young lawyer. We, we also want you to give a, give some sort of suggestions to young lawyers uh, in a sense that what would be your suggestions to young lawyers coming up in the legal fraternity, like a gender, in a gender right. sense? My suggestion to young lawyers would be depending on what you want to do, either you want to go to the corporate side, you want to go into policy, you want to get into litigation, is to join a firm or a company or a lawyer who will mentor you rather than running towards the big law firms or even though that's nothing wrong in it or going to the big seniors, rather than that, join someone, join a place, join an organization where they will depend on you, right? They will give you responsibility. And it's only then that I feel that you can actually grow and learn. Because if you don't feel responsible in an organization, you can just give the work to someone else. And the senior or the boss or your partner or anyone who works with you may not want, you know, he will go to the person who he trusts. So rather than going to the big law firms, yes, okay, if there are financial considerations, that's a separate issue. But my suggestion would be to whatever field you want to go into law, go to an organization where you will be given responsibility, where you can actually show something rather than to just go to a big, to just be another person in a big place. And yeah, that's, that's, I think I, this is a suggestion I give to everyone who even joins my chamber that, you know, there's no point as for me to join the big senior councils because you will not learn too much over there. Mm -hmm. You need to join a place where you are given the work, where you work hard and where you're given responsibility. That is why one of the reasons was when I moved from Amarchan to Badia because I felt in Badia, I felt more involved in the matter in a slightly smaller law firm than a big law firm. So and that's just me. And there are other views also to this. But I that's, mean, that's, that's like working with startups. I mean, you know, when you, when you work with a startup, you get to learn more. Practically, you're involved in every decision, yeah, everything. Yeah. So you see everything very closely. And I, think, I think that's what gives you the confidence then to do the other things or to do big matters or to appear in court because no one is going to just go out there and argue the biggest case, right? We will start small. And once you start doing the small things properly, the big things eventually come. 
Well, that's why, right? I mean, it makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. But right, we had a great discussion with Mr. Tiwari so far, and if somebody wants to learn more about him, you can search for him on LinkedIn. I believe yeah. the professional social media that he is very rigorously on. Yeah. Uh, and uh, for the, I mean, for someone who is really looking forward to working with him, you can also find find uh, Mr. Abdul Tiwari on LinkedIn. We'll try to put the handle. in the description below yeah. and uh, let's let's thank mr devari so thank you very much sir for joining uh, us and sharing such great insights with us uh, on today's session we look forward to having a chat with you again in you. in the future on some other trending topics in the international uh, legal industry as well yeah, yeah thank you so much thank, thank you. you sir thank you very much and for our viewers if you like this chat uh, with with mr uh, devari please like this video share this video and click on that red button subscribe to click up a creators youtube channel to appreciate what we do and you have more coming in from industry leaders like mr santap tiwari this was sagar for lexstock world signing off thank you very much <laughs>